really excited to have um, Brad Lightcap with us today. Thank you, Brad, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, Brad, among other things, is the Chief Operating Officer of OpenAI, which is a small startup. Has anybody heard of it? It's like, you, they, they have potential. They have potential. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of how he sees the world from his perspective. And part of our challenge and our intention today was to bring people who see the world of AI from, from different vantage points. Some people mainly see the dangers, some people mainly see what's positive. Uh, with Brad, we'll get kind of an inside look of uh, what it's like to sit kind of in the front seat of the spaceship as it takes off. <laughs> um, so Brad, I thought we could start just by maybe hearing a little bit about how you ended up in a at OpenAI and why you chose to put your time and energy and heart into that particular vehicle. Um, sure. Um, well, thank you again for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, love to talk a little about AI. I don't have a lot of wisdom, so I'll try, <laughs> try my best. But, we have um, other people for that. That's good. Um, so, uh, you know, I ended up at OpenAI kind of as an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working with Sam at Y Combinator. Uh, they had raised a growth fund, and I was investing in the growth funds. I come from a finance background. Um, and he asked me one day if I could help find him someone to work on the OpenAI project. Wow. And I tried for about a month to find uh, someone that could help work on what at the time was a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And I struck out. I was like 0 for 20. Uh, all of my friends make too much money and to work at a nonprofit, and they were all like, I've, what, what, I, don't, I don't understand what, what, this, what this whole thing is. What is it, AGI? I don't, I don't get it. And, um, and so I went back empty-handed and said, you know what, I'll, I'll help you work on it. And, uh, you know, one thing turned to another, and nights and weekends turned to basically a full-time job, right. and I, I ended up uh, moving over full-time. But uh, in the process, I learned a lot about what the mission of the company was, what mm -hmm. the mission of, of OpenAI was, um, what people meant by AGI, and what that pursuit really mm -hmm. translated to. Um, and then also took a look at the shape of the curves in the field. And so if you look at how you kind of delineate progress and demarcate progress in the field, you can basically trace whether it's loss curves or performance you know, on benchmarks that you test your systems against. And one of the things you notice very quickly is the performance on these systems as you scale them up goes from like bad, 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 good, great, superhuman. Okay. And almost every curve in the field kind of has that trend line. Mm -hmm. um, and as an investor, I'm trained to look for things where the mm -hmm. curve the gets curve steeper over time. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, well, if this is real and if this holds, this could be very impactful uh, and it's probably something we should pay more attention to. Cool. One of the things we've been talking about here is just the vision of the world that we want to move into. And Ben Jones is in here earlier, also talking about kind of vision. And I'm curious, could you say a little bit about the vision at OpenAI in terms of AI that supports all of humanity and how that, like, what's the world that, that, that you see if everything goes right? <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, it goes back to those, those curves, right? We, we always imagine, uh, imagine these kind of increasingly powerful systems. I think we we didn't know at what rate they would get as mm -hmm. powerful as we envisioned them getting. I think that's the yeah. tricky thing about exponentials is very small differences in your forecasting mm -hmm. ability could land you in very different places yeah. on very different timelines. And so that was the premise for starting as a nonprofit um, was we thought it was reasonable to assume that even inside of a decade, we might end up in a place where we had these systems that were performant on most things or all things at the level of humans, if not having surpassed mm -hmm. on, on most or all things. And, you know, again, it's hard to, to know exactly what the path there is from a technical perspective, a social perspective, a deployment perspective, but we knew a few things had to be true. One is um, we have to have a conversation publicly about how these systems are going to get built and deployed. Um, two is we have to share standards and alignment around safety and, and what it means to, to use these systems in a safe way. Um, and three is we should think about, you know, the impact that these systems are going to have on communities all over the world. And, uh, and so we have what, this concept of what we call broad benefit mm -hmm. in our mission, which is really to make sure that um, the technology isn't just advantaging one group of people or one yeah. country or, uh, or one population. We really take a very global view in the lowercase g sense mm -hmm. of the word uh, to how we think about you know, democratizing and deploying the technology. Yeah. We talked a little bit before about kind of incentives too, in terms of like social media was created with certain incentives and it's unclear the, uh, with AI, how does it grow and expand? And there's the danger of an advertising model of a super intelligent human being that knows how to manipulate us. And I'm curious, is it, does it still feel evolving? How, what's AI's 
um, kind of like means of revenue or means of, of, of uh, motivation look like? Can you speak to a little bit about what your thoughts are around that and a little bit to the nonprofit structure? Because there's still a nonprofit that oversees the, yeah. the for-profit. Yeah, I'll start, I'll start with the second part. So we're, um, we now uh, have basically two vehicles kind of in our structure. Um, one is our original nonprofit entity, which is the original OpenAI. The other is what we call a capped profit structure. Uh, it's a for-profit, but the amount of profit that can accrue to the investors and the employees in that structure is capped. Um, per the charter of, of the nonprofit and subject to the governance of the board. And that board that governs that for profit entity is the nonprofit. So we kept the nonprofit very central in our structure. Um, we try and cap, uh, like I said, the amount of, um, uh, of value that can accrue just to the um, investors and employees. The remainder flows back to the nonprofit. So I kind of think of it as like the nonprofit's kind of lending. Um, to investors and employees the ability to basically co go develop the technology. If we can do it safely, we'll try and make mm -hmm. a return, um, but then the, the remainder will flow back to the nonprofit kind of pursuant mm -hmm. to its original vision. Got it. um, and then as far as you know, how we think about um, uh, where the technology goes and our business model, um, yeah, you know, we, we try and um, kind of skate to where the puck is going. I think uh, we very much look at the world on a plot T plus kind of two to five year timeline and we very much think about the systems we're deploying on that basis of what is the most aligned business that, that we think supports um, the capabilities the systems will have. And so if, for example, the systems become more agentic over time, if the systems become capable of doing increasingly complex tasks, um, we're gonna wanna make sure that those systems are deployed in instances where um, they can be controlled, um, where the parameters of, of what they're capable of doing uh, are, are well established, um, and so, um, you know, we, we very much look at, at building products that way, but then also our business model being aligned to, uh, to, to safe use of that. And so, um, you know, we don't, we're not an ads-based business. I don't envision us really ever becoming an ads-based business. Um, we, wanna, we wanna actually make our money on people deriving value from the product, mm -hmm. um, number one. And then number two is um, on people being able to utilize a product. So if you think about it like, um, almost like something that works for you, right? Mm -hmm. Making AI very personal and, um, and, and productive in, in, a, in a personal sense, uh, you should basically, you know, the AI, quote unquote, should get paid when it does something productive and valuable to you. Right, right. Um, and really trying to push decision making and parameter setting and, and, and standard setting to the, the hands of the company, the user, mm -hmm. whoever the end, you know, end point is, um, to define what the system should be doing. Uh, and then, you know, making sure it gets, it gets compensated when, uh, right. when it does that well. When it does what it does. Yeah. Cool. And you're, you're kind of on one of the front seats of the spaceship, AI spaceship that's like going really fast. What's the, what do you, what do you see ahead? Do, will we still have jobs in a few years? <laughs> and if so, what jobs? And how does your, from your vantage point, this all play out? And um, how do we make sure that there's the most advanced, amazing technology and that we also don't lose sight of the fact that like, um, like at least for young people, the, the rates of depression and anxiety are all, so at least in the US, huge. And they all have iPhones. So the technology hasn't really, it's been helpful in some levels, but it's not been helpful in other levels. Um, but I'd love to just get an insight from your eyes. Like, is this, are we like, in the next three to five years, um, what, what, what do you see happening and what are some of the challenges that we might need to tend to to really make it go well? Yeah, so I, I think we're, my, my guess, and take this for what it's worth, mm -hmm. is we're gonna go through this very weird period where um, on some near-term timeline, the narrative actually starts to shift from uh, this idea of mass kind of job loss and automation, mm -hmm. which I think has followed every kind of technological mm -hmm. phase shift um, to a world where people actually start to realize that uh, these tools are like incredibly empowering. Mm -hmm. um, the stories that we have internally at OpenAI are like, you know, people on our HR team basically performing at the level of like senior data scientists as it relates to parsing compensation and performance mm -hmm. management data. You know, we have, um, we built, rebuilt our entire support stack on GPT-4 um, and the need for that, you know, the, the, the outcome of that has been we want to hire more people to do support mm -hmm. um, because we can just enhance the ability um, that we have to provide great support to our users. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that'll actually be kind of where we go in the near term. Now, on a longer term timeline, I expect what we'll see is this weird kind of shift in, in the labor economy um, and, and in the labor market where people realize, 
actually that, that one person you have who's really good at doing the thing that they're doing is capable of doing like 10 other things. Right. Um, yeah. And the, the kind of 10 people I would have needed to hire yeah. to do those 10 things kind of now all condensed down to one yeah. person who's kind of just directing these systems yeah. as to what to do. Um, on what timeline that plays out, I don't quite know. Mm -hmm. I think the timeline matters a lot for what the impact is on the labor market. Um, but you know, our economy is incredibly dynamic. We're very lucky mm -hmm. that that's the case here in this country. And, um, and so I expect we'll be able to absorb it fairly easily. And mm -hmm. that'll just be the part of the phase shift that happens here. But one thing we, we do have to think about and we do think about is, you know, what does that mean from a global impact perspective? And yeah. not every economy is like ours and other economies have labor markets that are very much indexed to different, different jobs and different sectors. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that too. Yeah, I think uh, we were talking about this before, but I think a lot of people feel a little bit burned by the social media companies that they're like, we're just here to connect the world and we want to give information freely available to everybody. And it turned out that there was more complexities to that than we, than we thought. <laughs> And that sometimes the incentives of those companies maybe weren't what they said they were. And so I think as AI starts to take over, there's a little bit of fear in a lot of people, there's quite a bit of fear in a lot of people that's like, hold it, you're in charge of this like weapon, potentially, you know, this powerful force, powerful force. And we're a little nervous that the, that, that will be used in a way that is just more profit seeking and less humanity directed. And so I, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but I, I know a lot of people that are just feel like, you know what, we've been burned by a lot of lar large corporations before that are mainly just doing it for the money. And is this just going to be another example of that? And the danger with this is that um, it's, it's more powerful than anything we've seen before. So if, whether it's used for good or for not good, it can have a pretty strong impact. And I'm wondering how you, and I know you can't control what other companies do, of course, but how you guys keep yourself honest, if you will, that, that like you're attended to the market. Of course, we have to be attended to the market, but that the market doesn't guide your decisions. And if you could speak to those people maybe who felt like, you know what, I've kind of trusted companies before and they don't always uh, follow through. Yeah. And they're just nervous yeah. about this new thing that they don't understand. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like this whole thing's happening. I don't understand it. I know it's powerful, but I'm just a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I think you you know you mentioned it. It's it just it comes down to incentives, right? Um, I think one of the one of the really nice things that I, I don't take for granted in being what we are and being a relatively young and new company is we're starting from a little bit of a blank slate as mm -hmm. it relates to how we build our products, how we actually build our features, and how we serve our users. Um, and so we've tried to, to instill as best we can in you know a, kind of the ethos in the company of, of really just kind of building what people ask us for mm -hmm. um, you know and we can kind of filter those requests through what's reasonable and what we can reasonably achieve in, sure. from a safety perspective and other things but um, we're not beholden to any existing right. product surface right. we don't have kind of pre-wired incentives mm -hmm. of how something should work mm -hmm. or a, a certain type of product or business that we have to protect and figure out how to glob this yeah. thing on to kind of enhance that thing. We kind of just basically build what we think <laughs> is cool and what we would like to use ourselves and what we think is ultimately going to accrete to the bigger vision um, yeah. of the technology and what we think aligns with the future. Uh -huh. The last thing we want, obviously, is the product we built to be obsolete in like three right. years. Right. So, um, you know, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a, there's, there's guesswork in there, but you know, it's funny because we Sam and I both come from Y Combinator, and I'm not I'm not a super believer in um, you know, kind of universal fate or ca anything super karmic, mm -hmm. but there's YC's, YC's mantra is um, um, make something people want. Um, uh -huh. And uh -huh. if you ever sit through a YC batch, um, it, the number of times they'll tell you to go talk to your users will, um, uh -huh. is nauseating, but it's kind of true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's the beauty of being a startup is you can really yeah. distill what people actually want from the product, the technology, and yeah. you have the freedom to go build that in a very unconstrained way. Yeah. And uh, we just have a few minutes, but when we were talking before, I mean, I said, if you had to bet on who was going to win the AI race, you would not bet on a startup. You'd bet like on a large company because of the intelligence. What has helped open AI kind of succeed, at least at this moment anyways, succeed in ways that maybe other startups haven't? And, and how, how did you guys kind of get in the front of the, the field or one of the front runners of the field? Yeah. Well, being small was our advantage. So um, we, 
were just incredibly focused early on. Um, and that was just born of having a team that we could kind of just orient around one goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I give Greg Brockman and Sam yeah. credit for that very early on of being really um, intentional about saying we as a team are going to just anything that, that we do has to be in service to the mission, number one. Um, and it has to be the bet that we're taking as a team yeah. together. Um, if you look at some of the bigger bigger labs, I think one of the things you saw kind of in the era leading up to call it, I don't know, 2017, 2018, um, and even a little past that maybe, was uh, diffusion of focus, yeah. of compute, of resources, of investment. And that's fine, but the thing that works well in this field is uh, is basically pouring your resources into mm -hmm, the thing that's mm -hmm, working mm -hmm, and scaling mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a limited number of resources, a limited number of people, yeah. um, and we believed early that, you know, if you actually just made these things larger, they would start to work. Um, and as a startup with nothing to lose, we could make that bet, and, um, and the culture of the company was very much to, to, yeah. to make that bet. So Cool. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, what's, what's one thing that you think uh, when people look at AI that you wish they understood that they don't understand? <laughs> How early we are. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's like, I, it's funny, I, I spent a lot of my time obviously as, as our COO um, dealing with partners and customers and kind of the external world to open AI. And the, num the, the number of people I, I talk to who are just in a panic thking they, they missed something and yeah. <laughs> like by Q1 of next year, it's all over folks, like it's, this is the end. Um, I just remind people like we are in the first third of the first inning, you know, it's okay. like 1990 wow. in the internet, wow. I think. And wow. the things that we use these services for um, in the future and the types of services we use even in like three to five years, I suspect will be different than anything we do with them today. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and just to keep that perspective. And very lastly, if you were starting college right now, what would you study? I know you studied economics before. Philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.